Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is the price of wolves. How are ranchers compensated for livestock loss? And it will be presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. Aaron, thanks again for being here today to present to us and for bringing us such a fascinating and I'm sure controversial topic. Let's dive in. Thanks. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I think this is a fascinating subject and it's one that is definitely uh, has some relevance to the real world. And so without further ado, let's get started. So everyone who is paying attention today, who is tuning into this webinar, I imagine that you have some interest in wolves. They are a charismatic species. Um, and uh, they also have a very wide uh, historical distribution across the northern hemisphere so a lot of people are familiar with at least wolves by reputation if you haven't ever encountered a wolf in the wild i'm sure you know what a wolf is um, i'm a wolf biologist i spent a number of years studying wolves in graduate school um, i have worked with state and federal agencies uh, managing and monitoring wolf populations out in the field, specifically in the American West. And uh, yeah, wolves are kind of my specialty, but I have worked as a wildlife biologist with numerous um, Western wildlife agencies and have experience with a number of different large mammals that are native to the American West. Um, but again, I specialize in wolves and wolves are my livelihood. Uh, I've grown up around them my whole life. I remember when they were first reintroduced in the mid 90s. And now as an adult, I spend 24 seven, it seems like, uh, working with wolves seven days a week at the very least. And then when I go to bed, I, I dream about them um, and how to resolve conflicts, how we can better coexist with these apex predators. Um, I spend a lot of time tracking and trapping wolves. Uh, to put radio collars on them, to study them, and uh, all of this is to give us a better scientific understanding of their natural history and their behavior and their ecology. Uh, but when I'm not doing the biology things, I'm spending my time in the field working with producers and people who have conflicts with wolves um, killing their livestock, um, looking for creative and innovative ways to try and protect property from these carnivores that don't really distinguish native prey, things that we uh, define as appropriate for them to consume um, versus non-native prey or livestock, things that are inappropriate for them to consume. And that's really where the rubber hits the road is carnivores wolves specifically must kill and eat other animals in order to survive. That's how they've evolved. The order carnivora is um, pretty dynamic with a lot of different biodiversity, all of which is phenomenally adapted to its own type of survival. Um, but the consumption of meat is a very efficient way for animals to uh, increase their own nutritional gain and therefore ultimately reproduce and live out their lives successfully. Um, there is a lot of carnivores on the landscape, but today in our modern world, um, we've seen a, a great reduction in our large carnivore populations. And this is because they are typically controversial and dangerous, if not to humans, which they occasionally are, then they are dangerous to our sense of security and our economic well-being when it comes to raising and rearing livestock. And this is something that I think is important for everyone to realize is that these uh, conflicts are not a modern um, phenomenon. People have been struggling to coexist with large carnivores for thousands and thousands of years. Um, we haven't always been at the top of the food chain. Um, we've sometimes had to share the top of the food chain with other carnivores on the landscape. 
and especially when humans adopted agrarian practices of uh, animal husbandry, um, when we began to uh, herd and ranch uh, domestic animals for our own consumption, uh, we ran into more conflicts with large carnivores. And because of these escalating conflicts uh, over the last uh, two centuries specifically, uh, large carnivores across the world have declined in number. Um, but we've got some success stories as well because there's again a lot of charisma with large carnivores and people are working actively all over the world to try and figure out how we can better coexist with these animals um, that are, are so controversial. I often joke that if wolves ate daisies um, they wouldn't be controversial and we wouldn't have to worry about anything but again they've evolved to be obligate carnivores, meaning that they depend upon meat for their survival. And they can get it in just about any form that they they choose, uh, so long as they're not molested. And so this uh, conflict, again, really comes to a head because humanity has adopted in most places agrarian practices where um, for our own uh, foraging benefits, we began to uh, farm and we began to uh, adopt animal husbandry practices and methods in order to uh, secure our own uh, rates of survival in a much more efficient manner than they had been, or at least than we had perceived that they had been when we were um, hunting and gathering. And when you have domestic livestock, on the ground and you have large carnivores in the area, uh, there, there can be some pretty nasty conflicts. Um, again, because predators don't typically differentiate between what is approved for them to hunt and what is not approved for them to hunt. Now, I'm specifically going to be talking about uh, wolf compensation plans that we have here in North America because it's where I live and it's where all my expertise is. Um, but I have given several large carnivore specific webinars for natural habitat adventures in the past uh, where I talk about uh, grizzly bears and wolves, of course, but also mountain lions. And um, grizzlies, um, also known as brown bears and wolves, have a tremendous distribution across the northern hemisphere. So they're not just um, endemic to North America, they can also be found in Eurasia. And it's important to realize that there are um, different policies and compensation programs available to people who coexist with these animals in other parts of the world. But I'm specifically going to be referring to uh, compensation programs that we have here in. North America, most specifically in the American West. Um, but in places in Europe where wolves are again recolonizing and uh, growing in number, they have their own challenges and their own hurdles as they're trying to again uh, find some kind of common ground where large carnivores um, can coexist with humans on the landscape and we can avoid uh, eradication, which is the route we took not too long ago, about 100 years ago, um, where most uh, wildlife, large carnivore populations were targeted for eradication. Again, specifically here in the American West. Uh, but I like to point out that people who have settled the American continent didn't necessarily have um, malicious intent. Uh, our understanding of ecology is complicated and it's very new as well. For a long time, people didn't have really an appropriate or healthy understanding of, of how uh, ecology and environmental sciences worked. The environmental sciences are arguably one of the newest sciences that we have on the block. Um, the term ecology, the word ecology, wasn't even coined until the 1930s. Um, and so there was a tremendous misunderstanding of the role of predators uh, in the system and how it worked. 
And again, it's not just an American Western conflict. Uh, we had wolves all across uh, the Northern Hemisphere, but they were systematically eradicated out of most uh, countries that we have in, in Europe, as well as throughout um, the Middle East and through Asia as well. Um, so again, it's just kind of this, this misunderstanding of that there are, are good critters to have around and there are bad critters. Um, and domestic livestock are often or have often been classified as good animals. They're animals that we can depend upon and the bad critters are the ones that compete with the domestic livestock. And specifically in North America, this conflict of good animals versus bad animals really came to a head in the mid 1800s, not first with the carnivores, but actually with the herbivores that were very abundant on the continent and were consuming the resources that domestic livestock needed. Um, there are various reasons why our massive bison herds and elk herds and pronghorn herds um, which all were in the tens of millions, uh, took a sudden plunge um, to just a few thousand um, remaining animals on the continent. Um, but one of the main reasons was uh, we had to make way, if you will, for domestic livestock animals that were more predictable and could be used um, for our own economic benefits, our own sense of security again. And we have this terrible period in the 1800s that we often refer to as the Great Slaughter, where, um, again, people who were colonizing North America were very quickly um, exploiting the natural resources and were decimating the, the herbivore populations that we had across the continent. And it wasn't after those herbivore populations had been replaced by domestic livestock, mostly cattle and sheep, that the abundant carnivore populations began to really target a lot of those um, domestic herds. And so in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, we have records of uh, tremendous livestock depredation conflicts with predators across specifically the American West, but really everywhere. And um, a lot of these were were accurate. There was a lot of conflict, again, because we had wiped out all of the native herbivores and supplanted them with a lot of uh, Eurasian, non-native, domestic animals that were easy pickings for carnivores like wolves and bears and lions. And these carnivores, again, were considered the enemy. They weren't considered uh, worth anything to many people. And so in the early 1900s, from 1915 to 19, the 1930s, um, the government worked with local governments to initiate predator eradication programs. And this targeted not just wolves, but all carnivores, um, coyotes, mountain lions, bears. And these predator control programs were very effective. But again, I like to emphasize that this is not a new thing. In fact, that the earliest wolf bounty that we have um, ever recorded is from the 6th century BC in uh, ancient Greece. So for a long time, people have been having conflicts with large carnivores. But what made this modern era um, so successful at quickly eradicating predators is we began to change our methods and incorporate poison with uh, trapping and with bullets. Um, but poison is really the the nail in the coffin that killed off most of our, our large carnivores, um, especially wolves. You can see their historic range was basically everywhere in, in uh, North America. Um, we had the red wolf, a different species, Canis rufus, that was living in the southeastern portion of the United States, um, which is why the gray wolf was kind of absent from, from that portion of the map. But uh, even the red wolf, of course, was targeted so the wolf range shrank greatly. And then we had a change in public sentiment and uh, the wolf was listed as being uh, regionally eradicated from the contiguous United States 
and was put on the Endangered Species Act list in 1974. And due to a shift in public sentiment, we began to work to reintroduce wolves to some of their historic range. And in the mid 90s, specifically 1995 and 1996, we live trapped um, 66 wolves in Canada and we reintroduced them into the Northern Rocky Mountain states. Um, Yellowstone National Park is what most people are familiar with and that's what they think of when we talk about uh, wolf reintroduction, but it actually also took place in central Idaho and it was uh, scheduled to take place in northwestern Montana, but wolves coincidentally and conveniently began to recolonize northwestern Montana all on their own, um, trickling down from Canada and across the border by the time that reintroduction was supposed to take place there. And I'm skimming over a lot of this. I hope that many of you who are watching today have seen my other uh, natural habitat webinars, but I've given quite a number of them now on the wolf reintroduction um, that took place in the 90s. And so you can go back and watch those for, for more details. But I'm just trying to recap what happened and why we are here today talking about compensation programs. Um, but it is important to realize that with wolf reintroductions into the Northern Mountain Rocky, or the Northern Rocky Mountains, um, the population has grown uh, significantly from those original 66 that were brought down from Canada. Um, the population, despite us as humans uh, hunting and trapping wolves in the Western states um, through regulated uh, hunting and trapping seasons, the population has still continued to grow. And we have you know, several thousand wolves in the lower 48 states today. Um, in the Northern Rocky Mountains, we have probably 1,500 wolves in Idaho, 1,100 wolves in Montana, 300 wolves in, in uh, Wyoming, in the Pacific Northwest. We've got about 180 wolves in uh, Washington, another 180 wolves in Oregon. We've also reintroduced the subspecies uh, the Mexican gray wolf down into Arizona and New Mexico, where we've got about 170. And then the Great Lake states, where wolves were never quite um, completely eradicated, uh, the population has grown to be in Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And we have probably three to 4,000 wolves over there at least. So, yeah, from going from zero wolves just a few decades ago to suddenly having wolves back on the landscape it's it's really quite a remarkable success and it's not just because of our own efforts in trying to conserve and uh, reintroduce this native species onto its historical range but uh, really the biology of the animal has to be congratulated as well because wolves are extremely adaptive they're immensely prolific and they can survive. Um, they quite literally can take a bullet, um, despite sometimes our best efforts to eradicate them. Uh, so long as we don't use poison, they do pretty darn well. Um, but the problem now that we have with wolves on the landscape in the 21st century is that despite being adaptive, um, wolves can live just as easily in our backyards as coyotes can. That's one of the myths about wolves is that they require wilderness um, in other parts of the world, such as India and uh, Rome, Italy. Wolves live in dumps and they eat, you know, human refuse and they they live in alleys and they act very similar to coyotes. The reputation that coyotes have can be applied to, to wolves if we let that. But very often we don't let that happen because we have what's called a social caring capacity for the wolf, just as we do for many of our large carnivores. Um, there's social caring capacities and there are biological caring capacities. A biological caring capacity is um, basically in a nutshell, how many animals can live in a population based off of the number of resources available to them. 
Um, so the resources dictate how many animals can survive. So if you have a, a specialist species like the panda bear, an animal that only eats one kind of food, um, the panda population is really going to be, um, its abundance is going to be determined based on uh, how much food is available in the bamboo forests. Um, more bamboo forests, more panda bears, kind of simply put. But because the wolf is a generalist, it can eat elk and moose and bison, but it can also eat cats and dogs and sheep and cattle and garbage. Um, they can live just about anywhere. Um, again, they, they have no um, biological restriction um, regarding their, their foraging capabilities. Um, nevertheless, there is a social caring capacity where we humans do have uh, conflicts with wolves. Um, we're not okay with wolves eating our sheep and our cattle, and we're not okay with them eating our dogs and our cats and eating our garbage. Um, so again, it's, it's a human uh, tolerance issue rather than a biological issue, which ultimately restricts the wolf and other large carnivores of where they can and cannot live. And since we reintroduced the wolf, the landscape in the contiguous United States and all over the world really has changed quite greatly. There's more people for one thing, and we take up more space. We have a bigger footprint. And yes, it's true that wolves are an apex predator on the landscape, but again, we manage the modern world basically um, based off of a social caring capacity. So there are lots of anthropogenic variables at play which dictate where wolves and other animals can and cannot live. And uh, one of the biggest complications that we have is we've got hyper-urbanization where lots of people want to move into areas that is suitable for wildlife habitat. And we're seeing that in the American West specifically, um, the American West has a rugged and romantic kind of uh, persona. And one of the reasons for that is because the landscape is pretty hostile. It's pretty difficult to make a living out here farming or ranching. And because of that, not a lot of people have lived in the American West for a long time. But with you know, new jobs where people can live in air-conditioned houses and work off of a computer year-round. Um, there's really no restrictions as to where humans can or cannot live. And so very quickly, a lot of habitat that is suitable for large carnivores is quickly being uh, dominated by people. And again, uh, we focus a lot about wolf conservation and we think about um, wolf conflicts with people as primarily being a wolf livestock issue. Um, but I look at it as a, a bigger problem is um, wolves and urban conflicts. This kind of urban wildlife interface is, is more of an issue in my mind than wolf conflicts with livestock because there's a lot of habitat available to wolves or at least should be available to wolves, um, but that is quickly diminishing based off of uh, how quickly cities and suburban areas are popping up in, in viable habitat. So when we look at predicting suitable wolf habitat, we're looking at several predictors. Um, again, because the wolf is so adaptive, we've got ecological predictors, which are various. Um, wolves really only need food, um, in order to live someplace. And because they are so adaptive as generalists, um, they can live just off of about anything. Um, elk is a great resource for many wolf populations, but we have wolves living all over the world in places where we don't have elk and we don't have native prey. Um, so as long as uh, there's food for wolves in one form or another, they can live there. But then we also have, on the other side of the paradigm, social predictors with human land use and livestock land use. And this is where, again, we run into more conflicts. And it's difficult to try and figure out, OK, how can we have such a highly adaptive and highly mobile animal um, 
live on the landscape without conflicting with human interests. And, and that's the challenge. Um, obviously, if you're tuning in today, then you have some understanding about these conflicts, but the majority of people don't understand or they don't truly appreciate um, just how hard it is to juggle uh, wildlife resources with human resources and try and find a balance where um, people aren't uh, extending their footprint in unnecessary ways. Again, because wolves are carnivores, uh, they need meat to live. And as I've hit on several times, wolves don't differentiate between native prey and non-native prey. Um, to the wolf, whose lifespan is generally two to four years, they can live up to 12 years, but they live and die pretty quickly. Um, they don't really care if it's a bison or if it's a cow that they're killing on the landscape. Um, they generally will prefer native prey. They'll kill um, deer and elk because they have that genetic memory that um, is correlated with their natural history. And so they pursue those kind of animals that are more abundantly found in the habitat where they live but it's not uncommon for wolves to come onto pastures, specifically in the West where we have large free ranging um, cattle herds and sheep herds. And they quickly learn that cows, you know, just like people think, make delicious hamburger. And sheep are, are delicious as well. Um, and this is where we as humans define predation where a wolf or a carnivore is preying upon um, some form of, of native prey versus depredation. And depredation uh, refers to property damage. Again, the wolf doesn't recognize that it's depredating, but we have to classify things in order to try and you know, make the peace and try and compensate people who are losing property that is damaged to large wild animals, in this case, wolves. So depredation, again, is referring to property damage. And that's the word that I'm going to be using a lot because that's the word that we as a society have adopted when it comes to talking about wolf-human conflicts. Now, I have to say that I work with a lot of producers or ranchers, um, and I am happy to say that almost all of my interactions are phenomenal. Um, these people that I work with are great, they're hardworking, and they're not unreasonable. Uh, I really am heartbroken when I see the news and the social media regarding wolf, wolf coexistence, wolf management, and uh, the stories are always blown out of proportion. Um, I get calls and I have to go and look at livestock that is potentially killed by wolves. And when I meet with producers, when I meet with ranchers, um, generally the people are, are just wonderful. And the experience that I have working with them is very wonderful. And it's extremely uh, reasonable and civil. And I appreciate that. And it's, it's a really positive experience. Um, but then as soon as the story of the depredation hits the news, then it gets ugly. And I just want everyone to understand, if you're listening in today, that from a first-person um, experience, from my first-hand account, um, working with these, these people who are trying to coexist with wolves, it generally is a positive experience. But it's important to realize why... Um, ranching with wolves is so challenging, why it's difficult, and why we have compensation programs for people who are trying to produce livestock um, in order to make a living. So ranching is uh, its a part of human history. Um, animal husbandry has been around for a very long time. And to make a living ranching in the American West is extremely brutal. You don't get rich ranching. In fact, I have some empathy because I grew up with family members who ranch, and I guess I've got sympathy too because I also ranched for a little while. 
Um, but as a biologist, I'm never going to get rich. And uh, I do it because I love it. I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. And ranching is the same way. Most ranchers are almost dead broke and they're trying very hard to make a living doing what they love um, because they love it. They love being outside. They love the connection with the land. Um, and I can relate to that and I appreciate that. And I appreciate the stress that comes from trying to make a living um, when you're not gonna get rich. The average profit margin for ranchers in the Western US is 1.2%. That's very small. You're, you're borderline broke most of the year. And you only make money once a year when you take your livestock in. And the tragedy is that all of these um, mom and pop ranches are competing for business with mega operations where 94% of America's beef is coming from corn-fed cattle out in the Midwest. Um, again, it's kind of a uh, an underdog story. And so when these people are getting hit by carnivores that they don't like, that they didn't want there in the first place, I can be understanding and I can have empathy for their concerns and their anxieties. Let's see. slide presentation there we go there we go um, a lot of producers too offer what's known as um, environmental services and I kind of hit on this already but uh, yes there's complications with our modern way of farming and ranching and there are people who don't do a very good job of ranching and they overgraze property and they overgraze um, their grazing allotments. But there are also a lot of people out there who are doing a really good job as, as stewards trying to make the natural ecosystem um, as good as it can be under the current circumstances. And if it weren't for a lot of these producers, um, we would probably develop these lands and it would shrink wildlife habitat significantly. Yes, it's true that perhaps a rancher doesn't care for wolves or bears or lions, but those bears and lions and wolves have a much better chance of surviving on a large ranch than they would ever have living in an urban area. Um, and this statistic just came out just uh, a few months ago. An acre of natural land is lost in the West to human development every 2.5 minutes. Um, again, just a lot of people wanting to live in wild places and kind of get their own slice of the pie. And I understand it. My family's been here for six generations. So I like to say that we started this madness, but it's just how it goes. Um, we need to have smaller footprints in the West. And again, ranching and farming uh, often offers some form of reprieve for wildlife. Now this gentleman here is Aldo Leopold. If you don't know who he is, you should look him up because he is one of my all-time heroes. He is considered the father of, of um, wildlife management in the 1930s and 40s. He's celebrated for really revolutionizing how humanity, not just the American nation, but how humanity thinks of its connection to wildlife and to the natural world. And he was very practical. Um, and I took this quote from him where he said, conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. And I think that that very accurately um, summarizes what we're talking about today with compensation programs. Um, because we have producers, we have ranchers that have hundreds of thousands of acres out here. And, uh, they are asked to or tasked with or ask themselves, volunteer themselves to be the stewards of, of these natural landscapes. And we want to reward them for doing a good job um, rather than, than punish them. Now, when wolves were first reintroduced, um, the tensions were pretty high and they're still high in a lot of areas where wolves are currently recolonizing um, habitat where they've been absent for decades. 
And I take my hat off to the Defenders of Wildlife, a non-government organization um, who really took the initiative of putting their money where their mouth is. And I stuck this book up here by Hank Fisher, who was um, instrumental. He was an instrumental leader with the Defenders of Wildlife um, in the reintroduction of wolves in the 90s. And his book, Wolf Wars, although it's a few decades old now, I think is a, a really great resource for anyone who's interested in learning about that, that reintroduction story. And um, the success of collaboration and civil discussion can actually play in uh, the roles of conservation. Um, but it was brought to the attention of Hank Fisher and the Defenders of Wildlife when the discussion was going on back and forth about uh, how and if wolf reintroduction will actually take place. And uh, they were um, talking about how this, this program to reintroduce wolves could actually hit the ground running. And it was brought to their attention that economics makes ranchers hate the wolf because ranchers are afraid of losing livestock to predators. And why would any rancher be in favor of reintroducing wolves when they're afraid of, of losing money to these carnivores? And so it was suggested that they pay for their losses, pay for the losses of ranchers. And in, by doing that, they'd be able to buy tolerance and take away the only legitimate reason to oppose wolf recovery. And so in the early 90s, uh, the Defenders of Wildlife, uh, again, as a conservation organization, put their money where their mouth is, and they initiated a reimbursement program where they would compensate any confirmed livestock depredation for ranchers in the West and ultimately in the Southwest when um, the Mexican wolf was reintroduced to Arizona and New Mexico. And over the next several years, um, this organization worked with government agencies who would go out and would look at potential livestock depredation. And they, if confirmed, um, would send a letter to the Defenders of Wildlife, and then the Defenders of Wildlife would write a check for the market value of the animal that was lost. And this success story really paid off for the first decade or so of um, after wolf reintroduction. And I think it's a really great um, model for how um, various stakeholders can come together to try and think of creative ways to make things work. Um, the Defenders of Wildlife is no longer leading that effort to reimburse um, producers for lost livestock. Now, each state agency typically has uh, generated funds through their Department of Agriculture to try and reimburse producers for dead livestock. But this is difficult to do um, because if you have livestock that you think has been killed by wolves, uh, very often actually seeing the wolves cause the death or the injury of the livestock uh, did not happen. People usually don't witness it. Um, but as a producer, if you're out on the range and you see one of your animals that's dead, unexpectedly dead perhaps, um, you knew that it was alive and kicking at least the day before, then generally what happens is um, that producer contacts their state wildlife agency, or in some cases, um, APHIS and wildlife services with the federal government and an agent or a biologist comes out and does a thorough investigation of potential depredation. And they look at the body of the animal and they have to base their determination on the evidence that they find. Um, wolves have a very distinct pattern when they kill. Um, they bite in different places than lions do and bears do and generally coyotes do. And so by looking at the dead animal, um, you can begin to piece a story together. You can also look at uh, what happened around the scene. Um, are there wolf tracks? Is, is, you know, when you're measuring the bite marks, or do the bite marks match up with wolves? Is the pattern indicative of wolf predation? Um, 
And very often we have to also consider hemorrhaging. Um, was the animal actually killed or injured by wolves or was it an animal that died of some other cause and then was fed on by wolves? Um, and that's one of the nastiest um, challenges when it comes to, to livestock depredation is very often you can have a producer who says, I saw wolves eating on my dead cow but you go out and you have to look at your dead cow and you have to then make the determination of whether or not the wolves killed the cow or whether the cow had died from something else and the wolves were eating on it. And usually the best way to determine that is by skinning the animal out. So you have to skin the whole cow or the whole sheep and you look for um, subcutaneous hemorrhaging, so bruising uh, where the animal would have been bitten when it was still alive and then uh, the blood would have uh, clotted and congealed underneath the skin where those bites had taken place. Um, it's a very long process. And it's, uh, there's a lot of high tension when you do this um, because people are looking over your shoulder and they're concerned or convinced of what happened. And you're basically being a detective and you're trying to weigh out all the evidence very carefully to decide whether or not a wolf actually made the kill or not. And all of this has to take place within a reasonable time. Because if the cow or the livestock is found dead much later than usual, uh, or excuse me, if, they, if it's found dead um, uh, well beyond the event of mortality, uh, there usually isn't much left. Um, even two days can leave nothing but bones, at which point there's no evidence in which you can confidently confirm if a wolf killed this animal or not. Um, there's a lot of scavengers on the landscape. Birds can reduce um, an elk carcass by 62% in 24 hours. Uh, and they can do the same with cows as well. Turkey vultures, magpies, ravens, crows, um, jays of all kinds. There's coyotes everywhere. There's fox, there's skunk, there's bears, there's lions that'll even scavenge. Um, and then, of course, there's wolves on the landscape. And so it's a very stressful situation because um, I got a call last night. Um, after working a 16-hour day, I got a call at 10 o'clock last night where a, a producer said he found um, a dead animal and he wasn't sure if it was a wolf or not. And at 10 o'clock at night, you know, I, I want to go to bed, but you have to respond to stuff like that. Otherwise, the evidence might be disturbed or you might not be able to come up with a conclusive answer as to whether or not wolves actually participated in that depredation. Now, every state is a little bit different, but generally we have depredation categories and confirmed, of course, is pretty self-explanatory where it's obvious that where all the evidence points to wolves having killed that animal. Um, but then there's also probable where it's it seems likely that wolves probably killed the animal, but you can't be conclusive. Then there's possible um, and or unknown. Um, you don't know what killed it. Or there's other where you look at it and say, no, this wasn't a lion. This was definitely a, or excuse me, this wasn't a wolf. It was a mountain lion. Um, but the goal of the state agent or the federal agent is not to determine the cause of death. The goal is to determine whether or not a wolf was the cause of death or injury. Because in some cases, <clears throat> you might need an epidemiologist to, to really look and see if it was you know, a viral infection that killed the animal or not. Um, but your whole goal as an expert is to say, yes, this is wolf. No, this is not wolf. And what's very frustrating is, again, sometimes these animals are not uh, investigated uh, soon enough. And one of the reasons why they're not investigated soon enough, and I think this is hard for people who don't live in the West to understand, is that um, we have tens of thousands of acres of forest where cattle and sheep are grazing. And your cowboys are out riding around and sometimes you don't find them right away. Sometimes it's a day or two before you find the carcass. And uh, sometimes you never find them. And this again is is very difficult. And for most states, usually you're only reimbursed if you have confirmed depredation. And probable, uh, in many cases, is not good enough. That's not to say that there aren't some states that will reimburse you for for probable 
um, depredation as well as confirmed, but in a lot of states it's just for confirmed depredation, um, which can leave some sour feelings um, for people who, who feel like it should have been one way or the other. And I think what's important for people who don't produce livestock to realize is that it's more than just the price of a cow. So when you get reimbursed, you're reimbursed with the, the market value of your livestock for that one individual. But say you lost a heifer, well, that one heifer was perhaps very fertile. She could have um, produced cows, calves, for your operation for several years. And so it's not that you just lost one cow, which is worth, you know, if it's, an, if it's a fine heifer, for example, it would have been about $1,000 to $1,200. You'll be reimbursed for that $1,200 perhaps. Um, but there's a lot of time and effort that goes into trying to find the animals. Um, there's the, the cost of feeding the animal that was lost. And then, of course, there's the potential gain that now is lost as well for these animals reproducing and adding again to the, the profit of your operation. And because of this, because agencies realize that it's more than just the price of the cow, <clears throat> some states offer what's um, called a multiplying effect. Um, Wyoming, for example, has a multiplying effect where if wolves kill uh, livestock and it's confirmed, then the state agency will reimburse that producer for seven other um, other animals on the landscape. Maybe I did that backwards. Maybe it's six other animals, seven total with the one that you lost. But I think it's seven additional animals. And let me try and explain that again. So if you're out operating on um, 20,000 acres, um, the concept behind this is if you find one animal that has been killed, and let's say you've got you know, 1,000 or perhaps 1,500 cows, um, there's a chance that you lost other cows that you weren't able to get to or, and confirm were killed by wolves. And so um, you're reimbursed uh, not only for the animal that was confirmed, but also times seven um, in order to compensate you for, for other animals that might have been lost on the landscape, again, in order to try and rectify uh, the situation. And there's multiplying effects for other species as well. Like a grizzly bear, it's I think three and a half for every cow that's lost, three and a half uh, times the market value is what you end up receiving. But some states also don't apply multipliers. Um, and so you'll only be compensated again just for the one individual animal. And as I just highlighted on, that sometimes is insignificant because Yes, you got reimbursed for that one animal, but what if it was a pregnant animal? Um, then you're out of luck, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time, again, to find these, these animals on the landscape. So fortunately, a lot of these programs, these reimbursement programs, also offer money for producers who are interested in uh, generating livestock protection plans or programs. So these have to be non-lethal um, methods in order to reduce um, conflict with carnivores on the landscape, specifically with wolves. And I'm going to talk for just a minute about some of these, um, these methods and how they can be applied. Um, but I'll have to hurry through it because I'm almost out of time. Um, but my point in sharing this is that uh, trying to think of not of creative ways to reduce conflicts with wolves on the landscape still costs a lot of money. Um, one of the best things that we tell people to do is to remove dead animals or your bone pits that are on your property. Um, animals die from other things, not just carnivores. Um, and then wolves or other carnivores come around scavenging on those, those dead animals that you have. And the best thing to do is to bury those <clears throat> large animals uh, but some producers don't have the the tools, they don't have the tractors um, to bury these animals. And sometimes in grizzly country, you might have to con uh, congregate your, your dead animals at a fenced-in uh, dump or a fenced-in pit where carnivores can't get to that. And so you can hire someone full-time to come around and, and uh, remove uh, dead livestock from people's property and you're looking at about you know $20 an hour 
to do that, but a state agency or a federal agency in some cases or counties might generate funds to pay someone to do that. Um, but again, this can be difficult based off of the topography or time of year where your, your operation is at. Something else that is very effective is human presence, um, but a lot of producers don't have the money to hire more cowboys to spend the whole year riding around, or at least the grazing season, um, riding around on horseback, um, herding your livestock. And so again, you're gonna be paying someone about $20 an hour per person to go out and tend your livestock. And uh, this is all based on, the success is all based off of human vigilance and and hoping that you hire people who are good at their job. Livestock guardian animals like dogs are phenomenal, but a good dog costs about $1,000, plus you have to train it, and then you have to feed it as well. So getting enough money to uh, buy dogs, specifically specific breeds designed for protecting livestock, is another great resource, um, but generally you need about three dogs for every 200 animals or so that you have. Um, so you're looking at a, a large group of dogs that you are going to be paying for and then feeding. And so you can get reimbursed um, or compensated for, for buying some of these livestock guardian dogs to protect your stock. Um, <clears throat> there are some limitations with those as well. Then there's flagry and fencing. Um, flagry is an excellent tool if you have a small operation. Um, 40 acres is about max. So if you're operating on 10,000 acres, you you know, Fladry is not the option that you're going to be pursuing. But even Fladry itself is very expensive. For about 40 acres with um, the tools required, you're looking at spending about $5,000 for a temporary solution. Um, but again, you can be compensated for this and, and state and government agencies can help um, foot the bill for compensating people who are willing to try uh, these these non-lethal predator deterrents. And again, for smaller operations, we have alarm systems that you can purchase um, that basically send off lights and sounds. Again, they just work on small operations and small pastures, but each alarm is 500 to $2,000, depending on the model and product that you're purchasing. Um, so that adds up really quick. And it's important that uh, we have ways to reimburse people who are looking again for creative solutions. And one of the best things that you can try and do is uh, think creatively. Um, husbandry adjustments can help protect your livestock, but it can take time and the bandwidth to think creatively uh, can also be costly as well. So without putting a price on it, um, people who are trying to look for creative ways to coexist with large carnivores uh, generally have to, they gotta change tradition. They gotta think outside the box and that can be difficult. And uh, because I'm out of time, I'll just wrap up very quickly and say that um, coexistence with large carnivores is possible. I, I fully believe that it is. And I also want to acknowledge all of the producers that I have experienced working with who are great people and are trying really hard to, to make this work. Um, and I think it's also important for everyone to realize just how expensive it is to coexist with large carnivores, um, specifically wolves, an animal that is so adaptive and has such a tremendous range, so much mobility on the landscape. Um, and perhaps paying for, for people who suffer from depredation is not the best route. I think it was a, an ingenious idea and I appreciate the Defenders of Wildlife um, for them kind of getting the ball rolling and now the state and federal agencies that are working hard to reimburse producers for depredation. Um, but there are also some studies out there that show that uh, by continually paying people who have depredation, um, it's, it's not resolving the tolerance issue. Um, it's like a continued apology um, for having reintroduced wolves onto the landscape and perhaps we need to be thinking more about um, funding uh, non-lethal predator deterrence. We can think more about um, generating funding for livestock protection rather than just for compensation. But I didn't get into, I didn't have enough time to get into that today. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a lot of effort and I think that it's important for us to realize that 
um, we who appreciate large carnivores, who appreciate wolves on the landscape, um, we have to understand that there's a lot of time and a lot of money that that uh, needs to be funneled towards individuals who are trying to make ends work. They're trying to make ends meet, and they're trying to to figure out creative ways to to coexist. And with that, I will conclude. Aaron, thank you so much for bringing your knowledge and perspective to this topic. It really is complex and and fascinating. Um, we have a few questions. Let's see how many we can get to um, with the limited time we have left. Can you explain um, why wolves or depredation by wolves is compensated differently than other predators? Yeah, um, one is, I mean, it's aside from coyotes, wolves kill a lot of livestock, which is unfortunate, especially as a wolf biologist, I wish they didn't. But yeah, they, they do kill a lot of livestock and also they have a larger, a lar they kill more livestock than a lot of other carnivores on the landscape um, in most cases. Um, and because they have such a tremendous range, um, for example, there are more wolves across a greater distribution in North America than there are grizzly bears. Um, wolves are usually the animals that we're trying to compensate people for having depredations. And another thing is wolves having been removed from the landscape for so long, the idea was to try and help uh, facilitate some kind of uh, monetary um, reimbursement program that would facilitate for tolerance. So people who have ranched without wolves for the last 70 years, 80 years, now suddenly they have to think creatively and they have to buy new tools to try and to coexist with wolves. Um, really, it's just wolves are new and we're trying to figure out how to, to make people okay with having wolves on the landscape. And the first thing that we tried was reimbursing people monetarily to see if that would work. Mm. Um, can you explain how livestock are killed? Does the pack of wolves kill one cow generally, or do they attack several cows in a herd at the same time? Well, it depends. Usually it's um, the young, right? So it usually takes place, it's usually young livestock that are targeted. So calves are born, depending on the operation, in the spring and or in the fall. And when those calves are very vulnerable, a wolf or several wolves can come in and they can kill calves. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, we experience what's known as surplus killing, which is never a good thing, but it's when the wolves kill more than one animal. Um, and it, it makes you know the wolf reputation for being a bloodthirsty monster kind of haunt the ranchers but what's happening is the animals the wolves are, are killing livestock that are vulnerable and the idea is to to come back and eat the animals that were killed later on um, but yeah it all depends on the operation i guess i'm not being very clear but usually wolves target young animals such as calves and also vulnerable animals such as sheep um, they don't have very good defense systems and yeah they they just run after them and, and bite them. Got it. Um, I think we have time for one more question. It seems that in most pictures of wolves, they have their tails between their legs. Why is this unusually submissive behavior so common in an animal that doesn't have a submissive reputation? Um, I'm, I, I'm not aware of a lot of photos that have that, except for maybe like, I'm thinking on my presentation, I had a picture of um, the wolf at a cow carcass and the wolf looked pretty submissive there because you've got a, a human that's approaching the kill site, taking a picture. And so if you're seeing pictures of wolves with their tails in a submissive position, it's usually because the wolf is aware of a person getting too close to them and they are uncomfortable with that situation. Got it. Well, thank you again. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to you for closing comments. Thank you very much for tuning in. Once again, I 
made a presentation that went almost too long. So I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, yeah, thanks again for listening. And hopefully this helped you understand a little bit more about how wolf coexistence works. It, it definitely did broaden our understanding. So thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.